Exporting is great. Welcome to this Glee and UKTI webinar about great British gardening exporting. I'm Trevor Pfeiffer of Garden Trade News, and with me today are a panel of British gardening export experts. I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves, and we'll start off with Debbie. My name's Debbie. I'm the Export and General Manager of Bosnia Products. We've been going for 35 years. Our core products are protective covers for garden furniture and garden bags, as well as other sundries. And we've been exporting for over 30 years. Uh, I'm John Goodwin. I'm the Managing Director of La Hacienda Limited. Uh, our products are outdoor living products. Uh, we export to 16 countries around the world. Hi, I'm Gordon from Wildlife World. Um, our company was founded in 1998 and we are suppliers of a unique range of wildlife habitats. Um, currently, exports make up 26% of our turnover. Hello, I'm John Murray. I'm the export manager of Haddonstone Limited. We make uh, cast stone garden ornaments, statuary, planters, fountains, that sort of thing. We've been exporting for 40 years and uh, our market is about 25% of the, the turnover. Uh, good morning, I'm Charlie Parker from GardenX, which is the trade association which helps British companies to export. So uh, exporting is what we're all about. Good, so Charlie will give us lots of good advice <laughs> later on. Um, can I, I, I start off, I'm going to start off with John actually, um, and uh, you've all been exporting for a number of years now, but maybe we can just start off with each of you the journey that got you on the export trail as it were. Well, I joined Haddonstone uh, 26 years ago uh, at a time when there was a great expansion in the industry, but we were considered the market leaders. And export became increasingly important. Uh, I think in the first five years I was with the company, exports went from about £60,000 a year to, to £1.2 So it was massive growth for us. Europe particularly was the, the initial market, which was very important. We had some distributors. Um, and as we grew from there, the, the reputation grew and we ended up distributing and, and selling our stone worldwide. Um, it's nice when we get to major projects because our product lends itself to sort of landscape designs and, and some significant, significant housing estates, but we also sell one plant or one urn wherever people want it. So it's been a major part of our, our success. There have been years when the home market has been very depressed and the market, the export market has actually carried us through. Conversely, there have been other times when the export market has been uh, very struggling and, and the home market's carried us through, so we, mm. we see it as complementary. And how, when you started off, did your ex now export customers find you? Where did they, did they find you at exhibitions? And we, 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 we start off with, we, we advertise in international magazines, which have a, a long shelf life, sort of world of interiors, country life, that sort of magazine. We also exhibit worldwide. We, we find that we, you need to commit to a market. Uh, we recently have been targeting so we've been exhibiting there since 2000. Um, and the first three or four years, you're not going to get an awful lot. But as you develop a relationship, you meet the same people again and again. They get confidence in dealing with you. And that's when, when the, the product starts to shift. And you get specified and people know you. And, and you, know, you, you develop friendships as well, which is important, I think. OK, good. Thank you. Gordon, yeah. how did Wildlife World get started on exporting? Uh, well, I joined the company four years ago. Um, and as I said before, I've actually been um, consistent since 1998. Um, there were some exports in place before I joined. Uh, I'm pleased to say there are a lot more now. Um, our route to market to find new customers is usually uh, trade shows, uh, visits to the market. It can be meet the buyers day via GardenX. Uh, we also have a lot of strong internet inquiries that uh, often turn to business. So it's a combination of factors, uh, a various sort of routes you need to, to follow to bring new customers on board. Good, okay, let me see if it's the same for Bosmir and for La Hacienda. <laughs> Debbie? Well, actually our route to market probably started off at Gaffer Cologne because we've been exhibiting there for over 30 years and company 35 years. It was a very good um, place to start with and as previously mentioned, building relationships with people that you see again and again gives conf confidence, brand exposure and also you need to be seen um, to be there, basically, so people know that you're there. And by continuing to go to all of the exhibitions, um, I find very, very positive. We are now also, we've got a web page, a strong web presence and inquiries, 
and all of this helps as well as the meet the bio days and also attending Glee and all the international bios that come there as well. Okay. John? Yeah, it's similar for us. Um, we started uh, Glee about 15 years ago and have been every, every year since. And uh, the, first, um, the first few years we did find a few international buyers and as we grew we then uh, went to other shows supported by Gardenex and we went to uh, the Gaffer Cologne, which is a fantastic show for international buyers. And the last four years we've been to uh, the hardware show in the States, um, again through Gardenex. But as John was saying as well, you know, we've been at the show four years and it's really only in the last year where we've really found a lot of traction in sales and we're seeing the growth starting. The first couple of years, hardly any sales, but just gaining contacts, interest, confidence in the buyers. And now we think that our business in the US is going to um, multiply rapidly over the next two or three years. Good. Well, so lots of di slightly different ways of starting there, but a, a common theme is, is trade shows and yeah. advertising. Charlie, is that, is that the, the common route for people to get into exporting? Yeah, I mean, ultimately trade shows are, are great showcases for, for the garden industry, whether it's here in the UK or Germany or the US or indeed places like Japan. Um, you're not going to meet the number of uh, potential buyers uh, in any other uh, in any other way that's convenient to you. Even uh, when I started out in the garden business, which was nearly 30 years ago, God forbid, um, uh, I was with Hoselock, which was uh, uh, is one of the biggest companies in the industry and has always been very active in in exporting. But it, but even for a company like Hoselock. Um, um, shows such as Glee and Gaffer Spoga are the places where you're potentially going to meet new distributors from new markets, new retailers, uh, which uh, maybe your existing distributors aren't already dealing with, and, and they're also a great uh, focal point for um, networking between distributors, between retailers, and between distributors from different countries as well. And from your experience, do, do people get into exporting almost a bit by accident? I, they have a standard a trade show and somebody comes along and says, I'd like to take your product abroad, or, or is it through that the, they have to have a plan to make it happen? I, it, it's, it's a mixture of both, um, but, but a lot of the export business that, that certainly the companies that I've worked for over the years uh, was, was often uh, chance contact, not only just on the exhibition floor, it might be in the bar in, uh, in uh, nearby or, or, or in a hotel lift where you just exchange cards and say hello to people and, and then encourage them to come and visit your exhibition stand at the show. But it's, it's, it's a, a mixture of kind of serendipity, but it's also obviously the best way is to have a strategic plan as well. John, you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just saying, just by attending Glee those times, it did, we did fall into export accidentally by some international buyers attending the Glee shows, but we then upped the game and then started attending the overseas shows. And say, um, I was talking to Trevor earlier, we've now put an import department into our business and uh, someone to manage that and some administrators as well and go out and target much more international business because we feel that's that's where our growth is going to come from over the next yeah. few years. You mean an export department? An export department. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you said import. <laughs> um, okay, so, so there's, there's, there's export business to be done. What, what I really want to try and understand from you, each of you is why, why British exports? What, what's special about what we do and what you do as suppliers that, uh, that people are prepared to buy into and, and import you know, from, from the UK. Debbie? Well, I think um, for most people that export, they have a good knowledge of the garden retail industry. And I think really it's a garden centre industry all developed within the UK. Therefore, we are ahead of everybody else. And people like to buy into our expertise and our knowledge, basically. And also, they like a strong British brand. So... Okay, so, so it's a strong British brand, but mm. it, that's interesting. So it's your expertise of having sold through British garden centres and understanding that market that, that's, that's part of the 
I believe so, yes, because the, in other countries worldwide, the garden centres are not quite as established as we are over here in the UK, and where some of them are actually developing their business as well. For example, with internet sales, um, Eastern Bloc is a little bit further behind us, and we're way ahead, and we actually have that knowledge and that expertise, and we can then pass it on. We actually distribute via distributors, who we then expect to sell on our behalf, so we then pass on our knowledge to them. Okay, so, and, and John, you mentioned to me earlier that, in effect, you're doing category management abroad? Yes. Yeah, yeah we, um, people buy into our expertise, our knowledge of the market in our particular niche sector, and rather than send out buyers to go and find the sort of product range that, that, that we offer, um, people are prepared to buy through, through us, and we then effectively manage a range for them within, the, within their uh, country or their, their, their retail sector. So, so, so we're, we're exporting our knowledge and our excellence and... And, and our design. Yeah, and, and the design, the yeah. R&D, yeah, right. that's the important part. And, and in terms of innovation, Gordon was saying that wildlife, one of Keith's strength of Wildlife World's exporting is innovating, innovative new products. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, our owner, Norman uh, Sellers, um, is a real whiz kid on developing new products and sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to keep up with what we're doing because we have so many coming along, but our customers love this. Um, just going back to Debbie's point before um, about why we have this reputation um, as, a, as UK exporters, as I think UK is seen as birthplace and really home of hobby gardening, and this reputation is, is, is across the world. And uh, we also have a um, reputation for high quality products and the UK as a whole has got a long history of, as, of a trading nation. So there's a strength of history that we can fall back on and give confidence to our customers. And, and John, what about from Haddonstone's point of view? What, what, what is it that you're, ex obviously you're exporting product, but what other expertise are you exporting? I, th I think the problem we encounter is if you, if you walk around a, a garden, the thing you look at is the plants and the, and the flowers and the beds and things, and you don't actually see the stonework. So we're selling a support material, if you like, and we have to educate people, particularly uh, international people, to the landscape architects to design into their schemes, sort of planters, the, you know, the classical English country house planters, fountains, water features, and that sort of thing. So our, our biggest job is just sort of showing people that the, the the part behind the actual the flowering side, that's, that's what we find. Good. And Charlie, any, anything else on expertise that, that people are exporting as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's all about, um, but, but particularly in markets such as Japan and the US, there's also uh, the whole issue of heritage and history that goes alongside gardening. So there's all the tool companies that grew up around Sheffield, the engineering companies that grew up around Birmingham and so on, they, 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 those kind of uh, countries love that kind of heritage story, but at the same time, they want quality, they want innovation, they want uh, uh, good packaging uh, and things. But it's, it's, in terms of knowledge, it's about a whole package. It's not just about the product, it's about the service and, and things that exporters provide. Um, Can I ask... Um, uh, it strikes me that if a company is wanting to start exporting, one of the first things they might be concerned about is the financial implications. Kind of, you know, the, it's going to cost some money to get involved. There's risks involved. How how do you go about managing those? Who wants to start off on that? We're quite strong on that. We we don't send anything out without being paid for it. We okay. <laughs> may not be good, internationally good, acceptable, good but. <laughs> Uh, that's the way we operate, and, and, uh, and I think most international customers accept that, you know, particularly for the first two or three orders. Yeah. Once you build up a rapport and a relationship, then, then that's when you can start talking about credit terms. But initially, we, we like secure payments, don't we? And what, what kind of sales force do you then have to maintain to keep your export business going? What, what's the in investment in your infrastructure? It's, it's an add-on to our contracts department within the company. So. Uh, the export department, there were just two of us, effectively. We serviced the local distributors. They've been with us, a lot of them have been with us many years, so they have a, a good product knowledge. So we don't find we actually support them overly. Um, they do their own exhibitions, their own advertising. So it's generally visiting occasionally and introduce them to new products and, and make sure that they have the, the support that we can give them. Uh, and the important thing is, is prompt response when you have an inquiry. 
um, particularly in the international market, they won't, they won't hang around for a week or two. You know, I've had an inquiry on the Friday, by the time I get back in on Monday, I've got two inquiries, two males chasing up the response, you know, because Arabs don't generally appreciate you're not actually there Saturday and Sunday, so it's, <laughs> you need to be prompt, you need to be um, persistent, I think, as well, and patient. So that's the three things. Okay, good. Gordon? endorse the patience and persistence aspect of that, um, especially when it comes to attending exhibitions. Um, very often, we, if a company decides, oh, I think I'll go to Garfa, Spoker this year, and do it once, it's a bit of a wasted effort. Mm. Uh, you're not taking it seriously. You need to go two, three, four, five times until you're seen as a, a serious um, player in the market. Okay. Um, and from a financial perspective, yeah. how, how did, does Wildlife World approach the financial risks and, and reward side of the exporting yeah. business? Uh, well, very much, as John said, um, we insist that um, first orders from new customers are done on a pro forma invoice basis, so we're paid up front, so that does mitigate the risk, and we also have um, export cover um, for credit insurance once the uh, customers become more established. Okay, so that's, that sounds like it's good from a cash flow point of view. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And John was saying that you do exactly the same thing with um, um, export what, insurance? Yeah. yeah, we cover all our export debt by, with insur through insurers, so uh, we set credit limits with our, um, through the insurers and we trade within those limits, so we do offer credit, but it's all, all covered. So in some respects, the 20% of your business that's exporting is, is less of a risk than the 80% of your business in the UK, where you've got n you know, numerous garden centres that could owe you money at any one time, point in time. Well, yes, but we do cover that as well. We do cover all our, all our debt. So, but but going back to the point of um, investing in in the export, I mean, I think it's very important to um, visit. You need to visit the markets and understand the markets before you're actually selling to the markets because they are very different. For example, for our sort of product, France is very different to Germany, even though they're mm. next door neighbours. I mean, it's you know, it's quite incredible how different the markets are, and you need to visit the retailers and understand what they sell and what is potential to sell, and that's where a lot of cost is as well in time and money. Debbie, from from Bosmi's point of view, mm -hmm. the the financial risk versus reward. Okay, most of the distributors we've been dealing with, we have in fact been dealing with for a considerable time and we're in the very fortunate position where I don't think we've ever actually had a foreign debt go down on us. Um, but on the other hand, that's also due to strict credit control should you actually offer the credit terms as well. Um, in our case, most of our distributors are all on terms because we've been dealing with them for a considerable amount of time. But any new customers, again, you've just got to build that relationship up. You've got to get to know them. We've also started visiting people so we can get to know what their business is like, seeing what sort of building they're operating out of. I mean, you know, if they're operating out of a shed in a back garden, God help you. But on the other hand, you know, if they've got a well-established factory and, or warehouse and that, it's very comforting to actually go and visit them and know that. So I think it's all about building relationships with the people you're doing business with. Because people that owe you money, they don't want to come and speak to you and talk to you. They'll do anything that they can to avoid you. That's from the UK side of things. So. Um, um, what about the ongoing um, maintenance and, and continued development of the export business? So we've got it set up. We're trading great British uh, knowledge, expertise, as well as products. But how do you go about maintaining that? export business, what, what, how much effort do you have to put into that compared to like, maintaining your UK business? Who would like to start I on that? Oh, John again. Yeah. The first thing you need to do is identify the market you're targeting. You know, all products have areas in the world where they're going to be more receptive than, than, than others. So identify the countries or the regions that you really want to export to and then visit the area. See, see what retail outlets there are there, see what trade shows are you can attend to, take advantage of the UKTI very generous grant schemes and garden export as well, and then actually get your feet on the ground in there and, and meet the people. That's the important thing. But don't try and spread yourself too thinly. You know, if you try to go worldwide immediately, then, then you'll just achieve nothing. But get into the important markets first so you, you know what you're doing. Gordon? Um, yeah, if I just take Germany as an example, um, you need to do some very simple yet some very important things once you've established distributors. You need to maintain quality, you need to maintain um, good delivery times. Um, they may sound like simple things, but they, they count for a lot. Um, as John said, visiting the market does help. 
Um, it's only an hour away by, by plane. Um, we also meet up with distributors, both the UK and uh, trade shows in Germany. So actually servicing the market isn't that difficult, especially if you've got the right partners. That is obviously a key issue as well. You need yeah, to the right so, so getting the right people. Yeah. Uh, and John, because you, you've been probably exporting for the shortest amount of time out of the group we have here, yes? Possibly, maybe. We've probably been exporting about 10, 10 years, okay. so, mm. yeah. But, I mean, visiting, I think visiting the, the customer is, is important and maintaining that relationship. We try to go to our European customers at least once a year in the season. Um, they normally visit us once a year and we see them at shows. So it maintains a regular contact. I mean, with the US, it's a bit different. And with our Australia and New Zealand, it's obviously more difficult as well. We tend to see Australia and New Zealand customers at uh, the Spoga Gaffa in Cologne each year. So it is a you know important show for us to go to to see uh, you know a lot of a lot of people from farther flung places. But with all that travelling, uh, a key another key component of this is you need to have a really good team back at base that can get on and run the business and, and do everything while you're out pioneering and finding new customers. Yeah, I mean, exporting, it does take time out of the office. I mean, you need to visit. Um, I say that's why we're sort of uh, installing a new export team to, to sort of take the pressure off uh, Simon and myself, who, who have done it up to now. Um, but, yeah, it's, t it's time and cost. It does cost, but, you know, hopefully the, the, the reward is worth it. And Debbie? Uh, to keep the momentum going, obviously, in the first instance, obviously, you have your good products, you're out there, you've sold them, but then it's keeping the momentum going afterwards. It's having the good backup services behind so that when the customer places an order, they get it quickly. They don't have to wait for it. They're kept informed. Should there ever, uh, unfortunately, be a problem, you keep them informed, and then you just keep that relationship going. And one of the other things for keeping the momentum going as well is always having sort of new ideas and keeping them informed sometimes ahead of the game so they think they're being treated specially and focusing in on your customer if necessary tailoring what you do to what they want not assuming that hey we are who we are <laughs> uh, this is what we do sometimes you've got to be a little bit more flexible and adaptable and try and do what the customer wants. Yes, I, I, I was thinking reason. about that. Obviously, to start off with, you're innovating in the UK, creating mm -hmm. good products that people are buying and buying your expertise, but there must come a point where actually you start creating products for your export markets that sometimes you'll end up selling in the UK as well? I think so, yes. Yeah. I think you need to be aware. I mean, we, we do statues, obviously, and some of them are scantily clad ladies, which don't go down a bomb in the Middle East, to be honest. But we do a, a very arabesque design and some of the fountains and things, which we've introduced in the Middle East, but now are selling well in the UK as well. So there is cross-cultural facet as well. Yeah, that's Any, one. Of sorry, the, Charlie. That's one of the main things that has been said about exporting. It's it's exporting companies that are likely to to uh, be more successful in the long run because it is all about feedback with with customers and the companies that I've worked for. We developed products maybe for particular markets that then had great spin-offs in, in, in the UK and other parts of the world. So um, th there's, there's all kinds of ways in which exporting can make you stronger as a company. And obviously it's providing business, um, business in markets such as Australia, New Zealand, South Africa is often coming through at a time when the UK market is dead for garden, garden products. And, and in the wildlife market, Gordon, yes. um, are we are the are the British regarded as the leaders in that field? Are you able to innovate, take innovations across Europe, or or are there some things that, that, that the Germans and the French are doing that, or Scandinavians even that you can bring back into the UK? Um, yes, I think so. I think we're, we're seen as the um, innovators and leaders for insect type products and habitats. Um, if you take Scandinavia, for example, uh, bird related products are stronger there. Uh, maybe something to do with the fact that they have a shorter summer and, and, and less of a sort of hot season, if you like, than, than we would tend to have. Um, so um, it does depend on which, which market we're aiming at. It can vary, but um, countries like Germany, Holland, France, etc., that have a climate which are pretty similar um, to ours in general, um, our products as they are fit well into those markets. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we have done and we're prepared to do bespoke products uh, and we can be quite flexible in that because we have our own workshop and all the products are designed in-house 
So it's something we are in 100% control of. Um, if we had um, a request for a bespoke item of any, any kind. Debbie, have you, have you ever been asked for a bespoke cover or particular product from Bosmia? To, Frequently. To, to fit American, uh, are American barbecues bigger than ours? <laughs> a lot of things American are bigger than ours, actually. Um, yes, we do get asked for bespoke products all the time because the furniture industry in particular is changing all the time and we have to develop something, a cover that actually covers a wide range of everything. So, yes, we have the ability to actually tailor things and you know as long as it's a sensible quantity and all sorts we can we will consider generally most things because if you don't it's it's a lost sale you know it's, we're in business to sell john what's your strangest request from an export market um i don't know it's difficult to uh, quantify i think um as debbie said americans uh, all are all the product they want are the bigger bigger items of the range i mean we have a chimney that's six and a half feet tall that they sell well in the States is, is, is a product that is, is going well. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Um, um, what do you think, what do you see as the future of British gardening exporting? <laughs> Can we make some... Who wants to go on that one? <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's great scope for the future mm. because there are so many markets out there. There are so many... The, the world is a changing place and, and I've been working in exporting for 30 years and um, I'm constantly meeting new types of retailer. Obviously, the whole internet and, and um, e-commerce side of the business is something that's completely new and there are all kinds of generalist e-commerce retailers but also lots of special niche people who are maybe focusing on uh, ecological products and that kind of thing. So there are always new companies appearing on the scene. The garden centre uh, sector still remains to be uh, be strong and gets more diverse over the years. It's, it's moved on a lot from the days when uh, garden centres were little more than nurseries that maybe had a bit of growing media and, and basic tools and things. They've now become destination garden centres and that obviously also brings in all kinds of new product areas that can be sold in garden centres. And, and many of the overseas markets um, develop differently and, and focus on, on different sectors. For instance, in France, the garden centres will also offer a lot of pet products. Um, whereas in Scandinavia, the focus is still very much on nursery and nursery-related type products. And that's what we try and do at Gardenex is, is try and help our members to understand where the potential markets for their products might be and, and, and what kind of areas to focus on. John, the future for Haddonstone on exporting? I, I think there are always new markets opening up. I think the, the, the British garden industry has influenced the world um, and whereas some countries are catching up with us and uh, entering into competition with us effectively, I think there are Places like South America uh, and Africa, which potentially in the future uh, could be significant markets for us. Good. Yes, I think two things. Firstly, in developed countries, um, there's an aging population, more people in retirement, and these people are likely to have their own homes and more often than not a garden. So that's an ever growing potential customer base. And um, second thing, generally, there is a wider acceptance now of green issues and the idea of looking after the environment is, is gaining pace everywhere. So these are sort of two real plus points for the future of people trying to sell into the garden market. And Debbie? For the future for, with, with regard to Bosmere in particular, um, it's definitely the sort of product we sell are very easy to sell on the internet and we find we're getting approached by more and more internet based companies who have a strong web presence and all sorts and therefore that's actually changed the way that we do business in some of the ways because instead of having smaller orders, you're getting larger orders. We don't. Uh, drop ship, don't do direct deliveries to anybody. So we are sending in bigger orders to cater for the internet type um, buyer basically because they are ordering in larger quantities in the smaller garden centres and it goes back to your distributors and how they're actually distributing in the countries that they are based in. So I think the internet basically is a very, very strong growing market and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about it. And, and John? 
Yeah, I think the world now is a much smaller place with all the sort of, you know, communication technology makes everything a lot easier. Um, talking to people. I mean, I remember the first time we used to uh, buy some product from South America, we used to have to phone the, ph the supplier via the pharmacy. He didn't have a phone. <laughs> the pharmacy opposite had a phone and you'd have to phone and they'd go out and run and find him and that was how your communication was with your supplier. Whereas now, obviously, you can Skype or text or you do whatever you want, send emails all the time. So I think that sort of helps the market, helps you bring the, everyone much closer so your supply, your customers are much closer to you and a lot easier to contact. For us, as La Hacienda, our, our main growth focus at the moment is uh, the US. We've sort of broken into that market now and expect it to expand rapidly. And the US is, uh, gardening business is over 10 times the UK's. So there's massive potential there if you get it right. So we are looking to expand quite quickly over there at the moment. So we've had a, a, a great webinar um, where we've learned a lot about great British gardening exporting. Uh, can I just ask each of the, the delegates just to sum up in, in, in one sentence, if you like, what they think are the keys for a success of British gardening exporting? Can I start with Debbie? You may. Um, a good quality product, a good exhibition uh, presence so that your brand is out there and is well known. Good, thank you. Yeah, I, th I think um, knowing your market, knowing the customer that you're selling to and tailoring the products to that customer. Good. Yeah, I think for any company that's starting off in export, um, take it one step at a time and prepare to be in it for the long term. And John? I think remember that uh, it's the, the quality of the product, but also the quality of the service you offer and the quality of the support and the backup once the product's been delivered. That's the important thing as well, to maintain the reputation. And before I come into Charlie, the interesting thing about that, that's not a lot different than what you have to do to succeed in the UK. You're just taking it one step out. And, and for all of you, it's over 20% of your business now? Yeah. Yes. So that's pretty damn good, isn't it? Yes. Pretty good way of expanding your business. Charlie, leave the last word to you. Yeah, I'd, I think the main message, for, particularly with a, a, a lot of smaller companies, which may be little more than, than one-man bands who, who are not going to have an export department or anything, don't be afraid of exporting. Um, use shows like Glee to find out where your potential markets are. See, you know, are you seeing people from the US? Are you seeing them from Germany? Use GardenX and all the help that we can provide. We, we can provide lots of help in... We talked about credit insurance. We, we provide lots of guidance on those kind of things, freight issues, um, ad, understanding things like languages. Obviously, the more you get into shipping into Europe, you're going to have to have language on your product. But don't be afraid of exporting. There are loads of opportunities out there. And it's actually people like the internet companies and the mail order companies who do a lot of the marketing themselves, who are going to make your life a lot easier. They're the good starting point for getting into exporting. So if you're exhibiting at Glee and somebody comes on your stand from a foreign country, take them seriously? Oh, yes. And, uh, and then go and see the guys from GardenX and UKTI who will be at Glee absolutely. for help and advice and uh, enjoy the journey of exporting great British gardening products. 